Welcome to the first video in this microfluidics course. So my name is Brendan McDonald, and I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at Ontario Tech University, which is located in Oshawa, Canada. So in this first video, I'm just gonna be giving an introduction to the course. So when I teach this course at Ontario Tech, it's taught as a graduate level course, which means that it's taken by master's students and PhD students, usually they're in the mechanical engineering program, but I've had graduate students in lots of other disciplines take the course as well. The thing about a microfluidics course is it's actually fairly broadly applicable. So what we're gonna be looking at is basically the physics of flows at smaller scales. And because there's a big trend now in almost everything to go to smaller sizes, there's lots of things in this course that will be applicable to lots of different fields because there are general ways we have to look at the physics a little bit differently when we're down at these smaller length scales. So because the material in this course is geared towards graduate students, there is an expectation that you'll already have some understanding of fluid mechanics. So like an undergraduate level fluid mechanics course, and I've actually made a series of videos for the undergraduate level fluid mechanics course that I teach to undergraduates at Ontario Tech University. And I'll put a link to those videos up here in case you wanna check out any of those undergraduate level fluid mechanics videos. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna explain what microfluidics is and what is the micro in microfluidics really mean. I'm gonna go through a little bit of the history of microfluidics to talk about how we got here because I think it helps us understand some of the things we do in the field when we see how we got here. I've also worked on a number of microfluidics based research projects in the past. So I'm gonna show you some of my work too, just so you can get a, a feel for my background and where I'm coming from in the field. Okay, so let's get right to it then. Okay, so let's start by talking about what we mean when we say microfluidics. So we know there's been this exciting trend towards miniaturization, and we don't have to look too far to think of some cool examples of that. For example, early computers used to fill up an entire room and they didn't have as much computing power as the phone that I carry around in my pocket nowadays, right? So it's very exciting to see the increased functionality we get from the ability to make things smaller. But what happens is it's not always a simple question of just, just make it smaller, right? Because when you make things smaller, you hit certain limits where the physics change at these smaller length scales. And this is especially important when we're talking about fluidics. So with fluidics, we're talking about things that flow, right? So gases or liquids. And generally we're interested in how do we get them to move about in a predictable way. Now we're talking about microfluidics. So let's talk about what the micro means then. Believe it or not, there are some conflicting definitions of this, but I find this figure really helps us out. So I've listed the source of the figure at the top right corner there. And generally speaking, we can make, I think, the most people happy by defining micro scale things as being from about 0.1 micrometers, and we'll call micrometers microns, to hundreds of microns, right? And so we see the one micron in this figure here, okay, minus six, because that's listing times 10 to the minus six meters, okay, as a micrometer. So we said about 0 0.1 to 100. So we're going to go not quite down to times 10 to the minus seven. And remember that this figure is showing a log scale here, right? So it's a about right here, that's about 0.1 microns. And then hundreds of microns, so we don't go up to a full millimeter because that's a thousand microns. So hundreds of microns would be somewhere sort of down like around that range right there, right? Now I'm gonna highlight that and what this figure shows is everything that falls within that size range because then we can see what these microfluidic devices, so these devices that are in that length scale, okay, we can see what they're gonna be really good at handling. And we notice in this range is life. Okay, and that's a big one. Okay, so we've got some different types of cells in there, right? Plant and animal cells. So we know that microfluidics are gonna be good at dealing with individual cells. We've also got the prokaryotes there, which are single cell organisms. So that includes bacteria. We've actually got the smallest of the metazoans in there as well. So some very small animals. Now, if we go further down, we see that they'll also be good at dealing with flows through porous materials. Like we've got clay, silt, and sand listed here that roughly fall on that length scale as well. If we go further down, we start to see what tools will help us with microfluidics as well. Because in this range, I've sort of highlighted this range now, we have the infrared and the visible electromagnetic 
magnetic spectrum, okay? So there are applications where we can use visible light or what's known as optofluidics. So that's cool to know that we can use that tool in this length scale as well. Further down, we see that we also overlap this microfiltration and this particle filtration. So those will be useful tools. We also have in this range electron microscopy, which will help us see what we're doing down at these length scales, but also we overlap light microscopy as well. Okay, so that helps us to know what tools we can use. So generally speaking, that's the size scale. That's how small we're talking about when we talk about microfluidics. Okay, lots of exciting things that can be going on within this range, right? Okay, now I like to walk through a very brief history of microfluidics because this can really help us to understand a little bit more why we do some of the things we do now by knowing how we got here, right? So if we start since around 1959, we've had the miniaturization of electronic devices. According to some people, has been the most significant technology development so far. I've got that as a question mark, of course, because it tends to be an opinion. It's hard to prove something like that, right? So what we've been seeing since 1959 is really illustrated well by what's known as Moore's Law, which is not actually a law, of course, but it's just an observation that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. It's been an incredible prediction, and every time people think it's going to stop being true, we somehow find some new technology or some new tool that continues to make it true. So we've seen this incredible shrinking down of our electronic devices, which, as I mentioned before, enables us to have these really, really powerful computers now, our cell phones, in our pockets. Okay, and it enables us to do so many incredible things now. So springboarding off that in roughly the late 1970s, this silicon technology was extended to mechanical devices. And this is a field known as MEMS, which stands for Microelectromechanical Systems. And so they started to be able to make these really cool and really small silicon mechanical devices. So I've shown a picture here from the Sandia Labs where they've made these really neat gears. And that's a mite shown for scale in the figure. And so in the MEMS area, they were able to extend what they were doing with the electronic devices into the mechanical space now. And they made all kinds of really neat devices and really neat sensors and things like that. Then in the late 1980s, we got into the fluidics. So that's where we start to see microfluidic flow sensors and microvalves coming around. It's sort of the very late 1980s to sort of early 90s. And Andreas Manns is one of the first, and he was sort of a chemist who was interested in pointing out that like life sciences and chemistry he thought would be the main applications of this right and so I've shown a picture here of a glass chip where they were able to start etching some of these small channels at the micro scale and as we saw from our earlier diagram of the types of things that are in this micro scale a lot of it was sort of life and cells and that kind of thing right so you could see why they thought that's where the first applications would be and they started basically using these glass devices with photolithographic etching and then everything kind of grows from there Okay, now this is a plot I like to show just to give us a sense for the popularity of microfluidics. So really, this is just referring to the scientific literature because it's easy for me to search that. So I went into Web of Science, typed in the word microfluidics, and what's shown in this plot here is the number of publications each year that had the word microfluidics in it. So we can get a sense for how this field has grown since uh, I mentioned these early 90s. We had these papers down here. So there was like very few. There was sort of like one in 92. And then we see it grow from there. I'm not, you're probably wondering what happened in year two. 2008. I'm not actually sure. Um, it's sort of coincidental. That's roughly the time I got involved with microfluidics, uh, which totally, obviously, that it's not why there's a there's a spike there. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that spike. Um, but we see this general like upwards trend, right? This growth of microfluidics as we find more tools, easier ways to fabricate these devices, more applications that they can use. We've seen this real rise in popularity of microfluidics, leading to things like this course where we can now talk very specifically about all the different ways we can do microfluidics and all the different considerations we have to have down at this micro scale. Okay, now I'm going to talk about some people involved in in the early development. And remember, this is just a brief introduction that I'm giving you here as an intro to the microfluidics course. So you can look up any of this stuff that really interests you and explore it more deeply if you want. So we'll start with Andreas Menz, who is in Switzerland. I've listed his affiliations here, mostly so we can get a sense for he's an analytical chemist. Okay, and I've listed here some of the early publications. So we see the applications that he had were chemical sensing, chemical amplification, and chemical separation. And so those are some of the early applications. So what we see there is the chemists realizing that if we can manipulate these fluids on the small scale, it's going to open a lot of doors, especially in terms of maybe chemical processing, maybe your chemical production, right? That's kind of how things got kicked off. There's lots of people along the way, but I'll just highlight some of the bigger names. Um, so then George Whitesides from Harvard came along, also chemistry, right? Now what he did was moving us into some fabrication techniques that made it easier to make these microfluidic devices. Talk about that in more detail throughout the course as well. But basically, I've listed his three, uh, three of his contributions 
solutions here, soft lithography, microfluidic channel fabrication. So using this lithography tool to make these soft devices rather than the harder devices like glass. Another one is PDMS polymer for microfluidic channels. It's using PDMS, which is polydimethyl siloxane, a polymer that can be poured in liquid form and then solidifies. So it's really good for molding and making the microfluidic features like the channels and everything that way. Made it a lot easier to work with. Also, he looked at some uh, chaotic chemical mixing as well, like a mixer for micro channels. And that kind of gets into where things become a little more complicated at the micro scale, which we'll get into later in the course as well. I'm also going to recommend a really interesting TED talk that uh, George Whitesides does at the end of this video, and also a paper that he wrote that's really insightful. Next, we've got Stephen Quake, also from the USA, affiliations Caltech and Stanford. And we see now we've got physics, biophysics, and bioengineering. Okay, so we're moving more into the physicists, the engineers, right? And looking at years two, sort of early 2000s, late 90s, we have his publications. I've just listed three of them. There are a lot more. He was known for valving. And so this is using some of that polymer, that soft lithography tools to make valves and other interesting devices that can let us control the flows, right? At this really small scale. Another one, there's multi-component integration and microfluidic cell sorting. Okay, and next we have Howard Stone. We're gonna look at his affiliations. Harvard is where he was and now he's at Princeton. And again, we've got applied physics, mechanical engineering and chemical engineering, right? So engineers can take hold of this and that's where we can start to really take a closer look at the flow physics, right? And really understand what's going on here to try to enhance some of these designs from the perspective of the physics or the engineering. So I've listed two papers here from him, Microscale Fluid Mechanics. He talks about that, like how do you engineer flow in small devices and also droplet and dispersion formation in microfluidics. So using these microfluidic devices to make droplets or dispersions. And he's got a lot of other publications as well that you can explore if you want to. He's a very insightful guy. Now what I want to do is show you some of my past work in microfluidics. I've done research in the past in other areas as well. What I'm just going to show you here is the microfluidics related stuff that I've done. I think this is a good way for you to get a sense of where I'm coming from and also a way to show you some of the microfluidics devices that I'm really familiar with. So you get sort of an introduction to the kinds of things we're going to be looking at in this course. First one is hand powered microfluidics. So we essentially made this device where in the photograph we're putting this syringe in on the left and then we use hand power, right? So your thumb to push the syringe and you end up stretching out this pump right here and then you use the force of it pushing down on the fluid to push the blood or whatever sample fluid you have through the device and I've shown our layered device here in part C where we have PMMA silicone and PMMA and that's pretty common in microfluidics as well that we're layering these devices what we did was we actually used a laser to cut some of these channels here in the PMMA which refers to polymethyl methacrylate which is a hard plastic and a PDMS uh, which I mentioned before refers to uh, polydimethyl siloxane that's one that you can pour and mold and then it solidifies. Uh, silicone, very similar, right? It's also sort of a soft, uh, like, I want to say like rubbery sheet, right? It's sort of flexible. It's not as hard as the PMMA. So that's what we use to have this membrane that can sort of be stretched. Okay, now another one we did is field tested milliliter scale a blood filtration device for point of care applications. And this was a neat project. I actually partnered with a hospital in Vietnam, the National Hospital for Tropical Diseases, NHTD. What we were doing here was we were trying to make a device so we didn't need a big centrifuge to get the fluid plasma separated from the solid parts of the blood like the cells which is known as the hematocrit and oftentimes you want to separate out the plasma so the liquid part of the blood because that's what you want to use for doing your tests and so in this case project was looking at testing for hepatitis B specifically so we made this device again it's layered right it's got the PMMA the silicone and then we had a membrane membrane was cool because it went from larger to smaller so it could actually physically trap the solid cells as they flowed from these larger openings to smaller openings and that would allow us to filter so they get trapped there and only the fluid could continue through the smaller openings okay and we tested tested at the hospital and ended up working really well. So that was a cool project as well for using his micro scale fluidics behaviors to trap the blood cells. Okay, now in this one, out of plane ion concentration polarization for scalable water desalination, what we were doing was we were using a nanoporous membrane that's shown right here. Again, we have a layered device. These layers sort of operating in this 3D zone could help us to save space. And we were doing desalination. So you had your source water, which is your salty water. Okay, now if we look at this picture here, here's showing the nanoporous membrane, right? So what happened was by using the, what's known as ICP, ion concentration polarization, we could make this depletion boundary, okay, where we had depleted these charged ions, and that would actually cause these charged ions, shown as charged species here, the salt ions themselves, to be deflected down into this lower channel here, and we'd only have the non-charged ions or the water molecules that could pass through that depletion boundary into this separate channel up here. So we'd actually be able to separate. There's the water there, and there's the salt coming down here. So we'd have the 
purified and the concentrated. Okay, and you can see the blending now of the microfluidics device, but we're also using some nanoporous technology as well. So down in the nano scale, which is times 10 to the minus nine, we've incorporated that in to give us this depletion boundary, which we use to push the charged ions away, essentially. Now at the bottom here, we made a lab and a pen. This was again our partnership with Vietnam for the National Hospital for Tropical Diseases. We wanted a self-contained device here. So we were kind of brainstorming one day, we were clicking these pens and we thought, hey, a pen would be a great idea. And so we also incorporated it in this one, rather than the plastic devices we'd been using before, we switched to paper. So we've got like a collection pad here and then we've got like the test paper, if you can see it right there on the top of the pen. And down here's a nurse actually using the device. So we had a little needle here that we would do a pin prick with and collect the blood that way. And then this device would filter the blood and then also complete the test over here. It was a sort of an all-in-one type device that we could uh, use to test for hepatitis B. and actually worked pretty well. Okay, now in this next one, we again use these nanoporous membranes because by applying this voltage across them, the same way we were able to deflect the salt ions earlier, we can actually use them to move some of these samples around on a device. Now, one of the things about paper is once you flow into paper, that's sort of it. You have your initial flow in sort of the one direction. It's a capillary driven flow. We'll talk about this later in the course quite a bit as well. But basically what we wanted to do here was be able to move the sample around. So concentrate it, right, or transport it around. After after they were fully wet, meaning that the fluid had already flowed and absorbed into the paper, that was pretty successful as well, right? So we did it with a circular device and we did it with a straight device and gave us this flexibility, right, to sort of move the sample around after it had already flown into the paper. And another one we looked at, you can see where sort of, <laughs> I sort of moved this trend towards paper in these later projects. I started with the plastics and moved on to the paper. Paper's a really nice platform to use because it's very affordable, very easy to fabricate, very easy to work with. So these are things we'll be going over in the course as well. And in this paper, influence of geometry and surrounding conditions on the fluid flow in paper-based devices. So we were looking to make sure that the flows were predictable, right? So we wanted to really understand what was going on here. So I'm showing, you know, this test chamber that we had built here, and here's what our test looked like. We took dye and flowed it down this device, and then we we're trying to understand how the shape of the paper and how these surrounding conditions would impact our paper-based devices. Okay, now I'm going to do this little exercise here so I can get you engaged in the material here a little bit. When I teach this live to my students, I always ask them to sort of look at this and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out which one you think is gonna flow faster. So on the left and the right, we have basically the same setup, right? We have two different paper devices. Everything between them is identical except one is wider than the other. So the one on the left is 35 millimeters wide and the one on the right is 10 millimeters wide. Okay, now these are gonna be dipped into the fluid at the top, which is just a red dye. They're gonna be dipped in at the same time so the paper just has a fold in it, right? And then the fluid is gonna be wicked along the paper. Now, now, in which device do you think it's going to flow faster? Okay, is it going to flow faster in the thinner device or the wider device? Now think about that. Make your prediction before I play the video. I'm going to play the video now. Okay, we've got the fluid wicking through. This is gonna take a little while, so I'm actually gonna speed it up. I'll speed up this video here. Now I think we can see by now, the wider one is flowing actually quite a bit faster, okay? And by the end, we've got the wider one. The fluid flows quite a bit faster in the wider one. Now, not everybody predicts that that's gonna happen, okay? So it shows us that when we have these flows at the micro scale, right, we don't always get what we expect we're gonna have. Okay, now why is this a micro flow? Because actually the small channels that are formed between the fibers in the paper are at the micro scale. Okay, so some of the physics that's going on here is actually at the micro scale, microfluidics. Now you're probably thinking, why, right? Why did this happen? Well, to be honest with you, we don't have a very definitive answer. Okay, so we're not 100% sure. But what we think think might be impacting this is that in the narrower channel, so when the paper, when we zoom in on it, it's a lot of sort of interwoven fibers, right? And so when you have a narrower, thinner strip, some of these fibers where it's cut off at the edges will sort of dead end, right? So they end up with dead end passageways where when it's wider, the fibers can sort of weave back and have longer flow pathways. And so we think that can actually help to make the fluid flow faster on the one that's wider. Okay, but like I said, we're not 100% sure. So this is really cool, right? And think about what you guessed, right? And if you guessed right or wrong, and that's sort of to show you that our intuition is not always great at the micro scale, right? So it's really interesting to see this kind of course so we can see what kind of behavior to expect when we're making these microfluidic devices. It's pretty neat. Okay, now again, we've got some more paper-based devices here. So this top one I'm showing, we made a uh, device that was capable of testing for arsenic. So this was called paper-based microfluidic device with a gold nano sensor to detect arsenic contamination 
of groundwater in Bangladesh. So we had some partners there, had some students that were from Bangladesh. So we actually got to travel there and do the testing. It was really interesting, right? So here on the left, I'm showing the device. It's this little sort of T-shaped piece of paper. The gold nanoparticles start out as red. And then when they have some arsenic from the water sample that we drop on them, they'll change to this more black color here. And that's how we could detect the arsenic, not just detect if it was present, but we could actually detect how much arsenic there was. This is the tube well. We were testing these tube wells. That's myself and my student Nushin. And over here I have Mosfera and uh, Mostasim, who was a student of mine. That was a really cool project as well. Down here we wanted to understand the flow in paper a little more and also look at different ways of fabricating paper. So we actually were looking at miniaturizing the features in paper-based devices by using a laser, right? So I'm showing in this figure the laser here and we cut these patterns out shown right here. And this was another layered device. So we had the paper and then an adhesive and then an aluminum foil. So a layer, like a substrate layer that we couldn't cut through and then we'd cut through the paper layer. And so we'd end up with the ability to make these very small devices here. And we use different dyes. And this one down here, we used a glucose test because what we were trying to do is use a small sample of fluid, very small amount of the fluid, but do a lot of different tests. And so comparing to, I've shown a Canadian nickel right here, you can see the size of the device for a comparison there. So we're, we were able to make these really small paper-based devices potentially use a small sample volume and test for a lot of different things. Okay, now finally in this one here is the last one I'm gonna show. It's a counting-based microfluidic device. So again, it's paper-based and this was capable of analyzing sub-microliter sample volumes. So again, we're trying to use very small sample volumes and it's scaled right here again with this Canadian nickel. And essentially by putting these three little dots here, right, you can see on an actual picture of the device, this uh, in this part over here, was showing a glucose test. And what we we're trying to do is to be able to know exactly how much glucose there was. So not just if something was present or not, but to understand how much of the substance there was. So by counting base, we could actually see by how many of these dots change color, right? These dots in the device, we could quantify then the amounts of glucose, which is shown on this axis of this plot here based on just counting the number of dots that change color and how much they change color. So that was our device where we could tell how much of something we had. Also using very, very small like sub microliter sample volumes. Okay, now what I do for my course that I teach at Ontario Tech is I'll assign these papers and videos, students watch them and then we come back and discuss them. Can't do that of course with the YouTube videos. So what I'll do instead is just very strongly recommend that you read this list. So number one here is actually a TED talk. That's from George Whitesides. He talks about a lab the size of a postage stamp. That's really worth watching. I'll put a link to that in the description below. Number two, there's a paper by Richard Feynman called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. This was done in the late 50s, early 60s, right? The date there of when that one was published was 1960. It's really interesting to see his predictions. He, at this point, says we really should start to look at smaller scales, okay, and understand what's happening at smaller scales, be able to make things at smaller scales. So it's really fascinating to read this paper. And it's not a really technical scientific paper. This one's really fun and He's a really great presenter. He's funny, he's interesting, so I recommend that. Purcell paper in number three, 1977, looking at life at low Reynolds numbers, right? So he talks about how organisms move and behave at these small scale flows. Also very fascinating. I actually have a friend of mine where this paper essentially changed his life. It changed the direction that he wanted to go in terms of his research. So again, it's a pretty good read. It's pretty easy to read, not overly technical. It's great at describing these things. And then number four is by Whitesides again, and it's called The Origin and future of microfluidics. That one was from 2006. So really interesting to reflect on the predictions he makes for where microfluidics is going to go and how we could see it expanding more. Um, great read. So I strongly recommend you do this. And I'll actually begin the next video, video number two, talking a little bit about these papers and some of the insightful things that I saw. So I really, really, very strongly encourage you to read through these papers and watch this video. All right. So that's where I'm going to stop for the introduction to the course in video number one here. Hope you enjoyed that. It was just a brief introduction really of what we're going to look at throughout the course and what we mean by microfluidics. And uh, thanks for watching.